All right, hi everybody. Um, today I am here and I'm going to talk to you about soils and the properties of soils. And then also um, we're gonna get into farming. So the differences between organic, inorganic farming, and we'll touch on how you keep your soil in place when you farm. All right, so the first thing we need to mention is pretty much what is soil and how is it formed? So soil is a complex mixture of materials. Um, it's primarily composed of, you know, dirt, uh, rock particles, um, decaying organic material, leaf, leaf litter, um, air, water, nutrients. You put that all together and you get what we call soil. Um, rocks specifically add a lot of the nutrients into the soil and the way they do that is by breaking down or a process called weathering so applying weather to the rocks to break them down to add those nutrients into the soil the decaying organic material tends to be the dead stuff that landed on the soil and is being broken down by things like worms and other organisms bacteria that may live in the soil you put them all together and you get this lovely soil mixture. All right, so you're gonna see this a lot. What does it mean to be a fertile soil? Well, when we say fertile soil, it means that the soil has a lot of nutrients in it. This doesn't just happen overnight, okay? It takes thousands of years to make this fertile soil, and it's quite sad that we're actually depleting it faster than it's being replaced. All right. What we call a layer to a soil scientist is actually called a horizon. So we're going to use that term. A soil horizon is a soil layer. And if you go down into the soil, you're going to notice there's different horizons and they're composed of different things that make them unique. So the first very top layer is what we call the O horizon. Um, so it's the organic horizon. It has the materials that were just deposited onto the top of the, the ground. So leaf litter, twigs, fecal material, those are all part of the O horizon. You dig underneath the O horizon, you get to what's called the A horizon. And the A horizon is also known as the topsoil layer. It's where you have a lot of nutrients and Farmers often have to plow into the A horizon to get to those nutrients. It also has a, a lot of what's called humus, not hummus, humus. And this humus is partially decayed organic material. Why is it important? Well, that is what gives the topsoil layer so many nutrients. It's very nutrient rich. And I have a picture of it right here. So this is what humus looks like. Again, partially decomposed organic material, very rich in nutrients. But do not get it confused with hummus. Hummus, that lovely dip, garbanzo beans, we all know, we all love. That is not the same thing as humus. So don't get the two confused. All right, you keep going down underneath the A horizon and you get to what's called the B horizon. Um, this is also known as the subsoil layer and it's primarily composed of inorganic nutrients. Keep digging down, you get to the C horizon, which is a lot of rock. Um, it's partially broken down. And then you get to the R horizon, which is the bedrock. Um, now, my students always ask me, well, why is it when you look at, like, for example, you look here and you see that there's an E horizon and you didn't even mention an E horizon, Miss Willis. Well, these are just the basic layers that you need to know. So you got to know the A, the B, the C, the O, of course, and, and the bedrock. However, if you go to different areas of the world or different biomes and you dig, there may be additional layers and there may be the absence of some layers. So just as a, a general rule, you should know these layers, but know that in different places of the world, they may be different, like different layers exist. All right, so we can classify soils based upon their particle size. So there's three different types of particle size. You have your clays, your silts, and your sands. Clays are the smallest and they are usually about 0 0.002 millimeters or smaller in diameter. 
you have your silts, which are about 0.05 to 0.002 millimeters in size, and then you have your sands. Sands are the biggest, and they range from about 2 to 0.05 millimeters in diameter. Now, why is this important? Well, because of their size, this plays a great role in how much, um, for example, oxygen or nutrients that they can hold in the soil. A couple of other terms that we use when we're talking about soils are porosity and permeability, and this ties into soil particle size. Porosity is a measure of pore space between the soil particles. So if there's a lot of pore space in between the soil particles, we call that greater porosity or great pore space. Um, permeability is how fast water or air can move down through the soils. So if soils are very permeable, that means water or air can travel with ease through the soils. Okay, so take a look at this image here. You can see a clay soil being compared to a sandy soil. Now when you look at the clay soils microscopically, you're going to see that they do have pore space between these very small particles. Um, compare that to a sandy soil, which has um, pore space as well in between, but notice that there's less total pore volume with the sandy soil. So we say sandy soils tend to have less porosity, where clay soils tend to have a greater porosity. Now, a loam soil is kind of what you want if you're a farmer. You don't want a field that is completely clay because then it'll be very difficult for water and things to permeate in the ground. Uh, you also don't want one that's completely sandy, right? Because we've all been to the beach, you pour some water on the sand and you know how quickly it kind of disappears. So what you want is a loam soil. A loam soil is a mixture of all the different sizes of soil. And when we do a soil testing lab, usually that's what we tend to find in our backyards here in Los Angeles. You're going to see there's a certain percentage of clay, silt, and sand in the soil. Um, why is this good? Well, it leads to medium permeability and medium porosity. So that means that you're going to have things um, that are able to travel through your soil, and you're also going to have pore space that will allow water and things like oxygen to be able to be in your soil. So this leads us into farming, right? Because in farming, we place things directly into the soil and we use the soil to grow our food. Well, a lot of farming here in the United States is high input farming. And the reason why it's called high input farming or tillage is because we are looking to maximize the number of products that we can get out of the soil. All right, so in high input farming, you really are looking to produce a lot of food. However, as we all know, there's downsides to high input farming. For example, um, it uses a lot of fossil fuels. It uses a lot of water for irrigation. Um, it tends to rely on commercial inorganic fertilizers. So those are fertilizers that don't contain carbon, and we're going to talk about why there's problems with those. And high input farming also relies on the use of pesticides, so chemical pesticides that kill bugs on our crops. A lot of high input farms are also monocultures. That means only one crop is grown on the farm. Um, if you travel from here, Los Angeles, and you drive up the freeway, like on the five, you'll notice as you pass a lot of these farms, you're gonna see there's only one type of crop that's being grown, and we call those monocultures. One of the main problems we have with high input farming is that it really does destroy the soil, which is what we've been talking about this entire lecture. Why is it destroying the soil? Well, a lot of the nutrients are in the A horizon. And in order to get to those nutrients, farmers have to plow. So they take these machines and they dig up the A horizon and bring it up to the top, to the O horizon. Again, they do this so when they plant the seeds, the nutrients, um, the seeds have access to those nutrients. Okay, but when you do that, you loosen the soil, right? And so if a wind comes along or water comes along, uh, it can easily wash away the soil. So you get soil loss and nutrient loss 
with plowing. Now there are techniques and we're going to talk about in a second that will help um, kind of control the soil and keep it in place on the farm. All right, so something that happened in the 1950s is a, an event that is termed the Green Revolution. Now the Green Revolution was a period of time where we really started to embrace this idea of high input farming. So you saw three general trends that occurred. Number one, uh, farmers began to plant monocultures. So they only planted one type of crop. Two, you started to see the increased use of inorganic fertilizers, the increase of pesticides, and, and definitely the increase of water usage, so irrigation. Third, we increase the intensity of planting. So instead of planting and let, letting your field go fallow for a season, we would just immediately plant again. So there was no resting of the fields. Now the greatest outcome of all this is that it produced a lot of food, okay, tons of food. However, there were some definite negative environmental impacts from using these techniques. Compare high input farming to low input farming. So uh, sustainable agriculture is this idea that you don't produce as much food, but you're doing things with a little bit more of an environmental conscious, let's just say. <laughs> so um, trying to reduce irrigation is key and maybe using different irrigation techniques, maybe like drip irrigation or timed irrigation to conserve as much water as possible. There's also lowered pesticide use in sustainable agriculture. They tend to use organic fertilizers. So these are fertilizers that contain carbon and we're gonna go through the three main ones in, in a second. They also embrace soil conservation techniques to try to keep the soil in place. However, of course, the downside to this is less food is produced. So not as much food is produced as it is in the high input farming. All right, so you might have heard the term organic farming, right, or organic products. And so that's a type of sustainable agriculture, but there's more specific rules to that. So if you're an organic farm, you're definitely low input, but you cannot use inorganic fertilizers. Okay, so only organic fertilizers are allowed. You definitely cannot use chemical pesticides, so you have to take a more natural approach, something like um, uh, introducing predators to control your prey. And definitely they cannot use GMOs, and GMOs stand for genetically modified organisms. If you can meet those requirements, you get to stamp a little thing on your box that says organic or label your products organic in the produce section. However, you probably notice that organic products tend to be a little bit more expensive than the non-organic products. All right, so here are some of the techniques that um, farmers can use to keep soil in place. So the first one is called terracing. This is where you cut like terraces into your slope. And the idea is that you can plant along these terraces, but when you go to water your fields, you start watering at the top, right? And the water will follow gravity and it will go down to the next terrace. Now, why does this keep soil in place? Well, if any soil does move with the water, it will just go down to the next terrace. So it is staying in place, it's staying in your area and you're not gonna have to replace as much soil as you would if you weren't terracing. Here's another picture of a rice terrace. So you can see they look differently in different places of the world, but the idea is still the same. All right, contour farming is another soil conservation technique. And in this, you plow or you plant with the contours of the land. So if you've ever been in a plane and you look down and you notice the farm is kind of like shaped like a U, that farm was utilizing the slope of the land. And the idea is the same as terracing, right? So you plant with the contours and then you go to the top and that's where you water. And so, yeah, the water slowly goes down into the other um, crops that you planted, but it also does keep the soil in place. So if the soil is running down, it still only runs down to the next level of your farm. 
So here's another great picture of contour farming. All right, the third technique that you can use is something called strip cropping. And this is good because you don't allow the soil to be barren. Like you're not allowing it just to sit out and be exposed to the elements. So the wind and water will not carry it away. So what you do in strip cropping is you pretty much plant different strips of material or plants, whatever you're growing, um, on your farm. And again, if you have vegetation in your soil, then those roots of the plant are going to keep the soil in place. And here's another picture of strip cropping mixed with contour because you can see it's bending with the contours of the land. The last technique, which can often be seen as you drive up north, are windbreaks. And windbreaks are really just giant trees that are placed, they're, they're pretty much planted in a row, um, on a farm and the idea is to allow those trees to pretty much slow the wind down so it doesn't hit their farms um, and again if they can slow the wind down they'll slow the amount of soil loss because the winds won't be able to carry them away. Here is another great picture of a windbreak. There are two main categories of fertilizers. You have your inorganic fertilizers and your organic fertilizers. Inorganic fertilizers are composed of three main things. You tend to have nitrate in them, ammonium, and phosphate. These three ingredients are very easy to transport, to store, and to apply. And you can easily purchase inorganic fertilizers from a place like Home Depot. The problem with them though, is they don't really add any organic material or like humus to the soil. They are a greenhouse gas. So when you do apply them, nitrous oxide is released. And that is one of the main greenhouse gases that contributes to global climate change. Lastly, we've talked about this in previous lectures, you can have um, runoff occur where the nitrates and phosphates are being added to the streams. This causes eutrophication or that excessive algae growth. And when that occurs, it does lead to a depletion of oxygen in the water over a series of events. So they're not necessarily always great to place on a farm. There are three main organic fertilizers. Um, that can be used instead specifically with sustainable agriculture. They all add carbon-based nutrients into the ground. You can put animal manure, in fact, that one's been used for years, into the ground. So either fecal material or urine both contain nutrients that can add organic materials to the ground. Green manure is another idea. So taking things like grass clippings or leaf litter and integrating them into the soil to be naturally broken down by things like worms and bacteria. And then the third one is compost. Some of you may have a compost pile in your backyard, but what you do is you take organic material such as like eggshells, banana peels, you mix them with some soil, throw in some worms, and after a while, you're gonna get this really nutrient-rich material that you can put in the ground. So a lot of people do go to farmer's markets. This idea of locally grown produce really appeals to people. And so you might be thinking, well, what are some of the environmental benefits of doing that? Well, there are a lot of them actually. Um, the, if they're locally grown, that means they did not take a lot of gasoline or fossil fuels to get to that location. So you get lower fossil fuel emissions from the delivery and transport of those um, vegetables or produce. Um, less transport of pests, right? If they're local, the pests tend to be local. So you get a less occurrence of maybe non-native species that are being introduced into the area. Less packaging. Um, the, if you've ever been to a farmer's market, you'll notice the, the vegetables are out like this. The crops are out like this. So you just go and you grab. You usually bring your own bag. So there's not packaging and plastic bags and a lot of use of the reusable bags. The produce tends to be cheaper sometimes because it's locally produced and transported. And then what I personally like about it is that the revenues remain local. So it's the profits are actually going to people in your community and it's helping them out. 
All right, so that concludes our talks on soils and farming. And I hope this was extremely helpful for you in learning about soils and farming for AP Environmental. Thank you so much for watching.